Hi, I am Jeff Montes de Oca. I'm an associate professor of sociology at the University of Colorado, Colorado Springs, and currently the president of the North American Society for the Sociology of Sport. And I am here talking to Paul Fitnui, who is a Maori scholar, and he's an associate professor of exercise science, uh, physical and health education at the University of Victoria. And we're going to be talking about indigenous decolonization today. So, Welcome, Paul, and uh, I appreciate you joining me. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks for having me. Cool. Well, let's get right into it. And I'd like you to talk about what are the, what are the what would you say are the key elements of decolonization and of indigeneity? Right. Both big questions, but both uh, deserve some time and context. So. Uh, where to start? So some people will suggest that we should start with decolonizing ourselves first in the context of looking at how we think about sport, physical activity, recreation, leisure, etc., or in general in communities or, or in society. So to decolonize, from my understanding, from many others who talk about decolonizing, even Tuck, Linda Smith, Graham Smith, there are many others who could quote um, Joe and Archie Board, Marie Batiste, mostly educators that I'm, I'm aware of, uh, would mean that decolonization is an active process. And what that means is that there are kind of some tenets that follow under decolonization. One is that we need to de decolonize ourselves from what, what has occurred in the past, the de disenfranchise of land, loss of language, the breakdown of our kinship structures, cultural practices, etc., and even loss of our languages. So decolonizing means in some ways to disassociate so that we can self-determine ways that we can repair, regenerate, and um, in many ways to uh, create our own ways of, of re-establishing those connections. The other part of the, the argument is also to decolonize spaces that we work in. And decolonizing spaces is, is, is a little bit harder because there are social political landscapes that are actually weren't meant for us in terms of our own um, ways of knowing and doing. So what that requires um, first is, is an examination of ways of knowing that are not present in the current um, environments and, and spaces that don't necessarily support uh, Indigenous Aboriginal peoples to, to affirm and in many ways self-determine their, their own ways of knowing. So indigenizing only can really, from my perspective, can only really happen when we've done this decolonizing work. And the indigenization is really the development of curriculum, uh, development of teaching and learning that supports um, our own histories, um, our own cultural practices, principles, and protocols. This is not to say they should be done separately. They can actually, uh, they can converge, they can blend, and they can become part and parcel of a partnership uh, in concert with other ways of knowing in the institution. So decolonizing work is very much a, an active process uh, that leads to indigenization. Um, and it's very difficult to indigenize uh, a setting or a context or any curriculum that you want to do without having that work done first. Um, so they're both they're the same side of the, the, the sorry they're both they're both the same side of the sorry equal sides of the same coin, but they require uh, quite specific attention paid to each of them to be able to do that. So let, let me ask you this, Paul. Um, how then might we go about decolonizing and ind indigenizing spaces, sp particularly sports spaces? And if you could address that given the reality of, of existing nation states, the Canadian nation state, the United States nation state, you know, we, we could list others, but there's a certain institutional reality that we're in. So how does a scholar like yourself go about this work? 
That's a great question, and it's one we've been dealing with for decades. <laughs> <laughs> so it's it, we have to understand too that this is a long process, a long journey. It's, it's a struggle that um, it's a struggle without an end, um, and it's a struggle that we consistently grapple with in our institution. So Graham Smith, who's who's been a long-time friend, colleague, and mentor of many indigenous graduates or indigenous PhD graduates, has always advocated for the idea that we need to create a horizontal and vertical shift simultaneously. What that means is that we need to um, advocate for leaders, indigenous leaders in senior positions at universities that have a have a interest in a wide range of it's not just the but here, you know, indigenous realization and practice. Um, who can then who can actually then create the spaces that we are many of us are struggling to achieve. Because for example, you might create a program one week or one month or one year, and universities are notorious for creating programs for the sake of creating programs. Right. And these programs are under resourced. Uh, they they come with very, real little funding. They're very specific to a larger uh, vision of the university, but they 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 remind me of equalizers up and down. <laughs> Vertically, they come up and down. And as we see, a lot of our a lot of them are, a lot of the programs uh, struggle to survive. And we're competing for resources, and we're competing for space, and then universities hold up on a high the ones that they particularly like to be the achievers or the glowing example of how everyone who's Indigenous should be. And I've seen that actually divide us and actually by exploiting the exceptionalism that comes with universities promoting who they want. But at the horizontal levels, um, we, we don't seem to get the, any change. The status quo prevails. So I believe it's a it's a it's a it's a top level change required with a vertical meeting that horizontal shift, and it, and it's a 360 degree intervention. We we have to be in multiple sides of, of creating the changes. I, I I wonder if you could, and, and I know it's not fair to ask you to address this briefly, but um, there's a fairly dominant model of understanding race, particularly in the United States. And it's popular amongst many sports sociologists. You know, it's it's a, a model of social justice, and, and people will say it's based on a politics of recognition. Uh, can you talk about how the scholarship you do differs from that, just to build on what what you what you just described? Yes, um, it is, and it's particularly. Prevalent in North American context is the idea around race and racism, racism, anti-racism. Um, I in New Zealand, the context that I've come from, there has been the notion that we can that we're a bicultural nation, that we should be a bicultural nation. And of course, that gets taken up in other discourses around multiculturalism, and then we got cosmopolitan and all those things, and then we got interculturalism, cross-culturalism. And we get lost in translation across those different discourses. I find race, racism, equality, equity, diversity, inclusion in the same, same context. And so what happens then is that others determine what level of race and racism or anti-racism they can, they can do, all under the umbrella of inclusion and diversity. And it seems to me that people become their own Determ determinants around how they define that. Whereas what I've actually tried to be more open to is the notion that we also have a process around decolonization that can then lead to indigenization, which is based on self-determination that leads to transformation. Right? So by, by actually having conversations that are much more critically uh, geared, um, and that are not cri not criticizing, but rather they're critically engaging with different groups to help us to understand our own level of values and principles that underpin our our own humanness. 
So an elder here, skeptic, often speaks about this, which, which I think we often just take for granted. We actually should, we should really stick to our values as human beings. And it's within the values that ideas around race and racism and, and those things tend to filter away because we're actually coming together in good relations with each other. So that's different from the, the racial discourse, right, and, and all these oceans about them and us. And it's also based on a, it's, it's also fundamental around values and principles aligning to the humanness of, each, of, of our relations with each other. Because we can't change necessarily what is actually happening around us, right? We're part and parcel of the changes that, that manifest themselves. But what we can do is we can build much, much better, stronger relationships and we can build partnerships and we can build, we can protect what, what we have and what we've been, what we want to preserve. Right? And at the same time, we can participate. So those three principles around partnership, protection, participation are not new. They're part and parcel of our founding document in New Zealand called the Treaty of Waitangi. That, is, that was built on the premise that we would be in, always in good relations. We would always dis, dem, uh, demonstrate and um, present goodwill. We would come in good faith. We will come in, and we, we will not come to take over <laughs> or decimate or dismantle or create things that we're now seeing as a result. It's not to say we can't have those really hard conversations around racism. It's just not the right place to start. That's wonderful. Thank you. Now, we're running a little bit long, but I, I have to ask you one more question, which is, for you, when you think about Indigenous sports, mm. what, what would you say is Indigenous about Indigenous sports? Well, that's a good, that's a good question, and it gets asked quite a lot um, in the context that I am, because we're trying to establish what we call an inclusion diversity uh, strategy here at University of Victoria, and one of one of the um, uh, one of the, the quick, one of the initiatives is to have a World Indigenous Basketball Tournament held and hosted in in University of Victoria, which, for many, will know is is very quite very dominant white uh, population base. And so the, uh, the question or the answer or question, question to the well, answer to the question is really, how do we do it in a good way? How do, we, how do we respect, how do we respect and afford the time, effort and energy for indigenous communities to come together to, to participate in sport? So we have the North American Indigenous Games, Everything is done with a with a ceremonial welcome. Um, throughout the course of the weeks that with, with people are participating in the sports, um, there is cultural exchange, reciprocity. There is there's opportunity to share in cultural practices and the ways that we do things. There's a gifting ceremony. There is a way the way that cultures can come towards the end and and share how what this whole experience means for them. So indigenous sports for me is really about families coming together to share their culture, language, and ways of knowing and doing with each other. And it's, it's a powerful thing uh, when you see um, people expressing um, their culture through sport. Uh, That's wonderful. Because it's what, what, you're, what I hear you emphasizing is community and identity and not emphasizing competition and records. So it's an entirely different way of thinking about sport than what we're typically than how we're typically encouraged to think about sport in a really you know colonial way. You know that sport is about domination. Yeah, there, there's certainly competition, but but the emphasis, the emphasis going back to to the three principles that I like to is around full participation and having families family centered approach to to helping to build the next generation of indigenous learners or indigenous young people um, and, and using sport as a media to nurture language, culture and um, our own stories and histories. Really. That's what it's really about. 
Well, thank you so much, Paul, for taking this time and sharing your knowledge uh, with anybody that's watching this video. And I hope that this encourages people watching the video to read the work of Paul Fittinui and other uh, decolonial indigenous scholars. Thanks so much, Paul. Thanks, Jim. Okay, bye.